Okay. You know, I understand. My name is Ronnie O'Brien. I understand some people thought I was going yesterday morning. Some people thought I was going this morning, and I'm just so glad to be here to be able to present. I don't care if I'm last. Thank you so much. And Jean, I know you're my moderator, but remember, I'm your right home. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so because I am the last one, uh, I'm, I might throw out some questions at you because I'm a teacher, right? So I want to make sure you're staying with me. I might throw some questions out there. Keep you awake this la since I'm dead last here. Okay. Um, so this was the long title I, I wound up with. So hand carts, the archway, and the Mormon trail along the Wood River in the late 1850s and 1860s uh, in central Nebraska along the Wood River. I'm going to go over some of these things. At the end, I'm going to come back. I want to talk about 1847. Um, first of all, before I even get started, I started trail research 36 years ago when I was 23, studying the, the Mormon Trail. And I'm not an LDS. I'm an, an, I'm an Irish Catholic. Okay. Uh, I met LDS people and started wonderful relationships with LDS people across the country. 27 years ago, in 1995, when we were planning the 1997 uh, 150th. And I'm going to throw this in because this becomes important. I began a relationship with the Pawnee Nation 19 years ago, and that's been a very long and fruitful relationship that I will also be talking about because it ties in. Okay? Are you going to tell them you were adopted by the Pawnee? No, I wasn't going to tell them that. <laughs> but thanks. Thanks. Little corn sister. Okay. So, I, just to tell you the things I did, I did help plan the 150th anniversary of uh, the Mormon Trail across central Nebraska. I helped wound up helping four communities with their celebrations, Grand Island, Wood River, Shelton, Gibbon, and then down at Denman too, uh, just because I had done uh, more research than anybody else, so I was able to help those uh, communities in 97. Then when I went to the Archway, if you're familiar with the Archway over I-80 at Kearney, helped open that. Uh, was there for, and, uh, I was there for almost 14 years uh, before I went to teach. But one of, the, one of the events that I put on there was the 150th anniversary of Handcart Pioneers. The Nash, it was a national event. We had over 200 living history reenactors come from 12 different states. They were all direct descendants of Handcart Pioneers. It was incredible. It was amazing. So, I'm just going to throw in some Squire Lamb uh, quotes here. Squire Lamb ran a stage station near the Wood River Crossing in central Nebraska. So, um, and they're not any date order, just something that I thought, in, that I thought would help at the time. Uh, he writes uh, to his brother in January of 1864, there will be a big immigration this spring. Some have started now. Very bad traveling, frost coming out of the ground. So this is January of 1864, and people are already coming down the trail. This becomes very important to my research and uh, my story because this, my, my interest started with when I married into my husband's family, uh, the O'Briens. They were part of the Irish Catholic settlement of Wood River in Nebraska. Uh, and Right away, um, I, I met my husband's uh, grandfather, and uh, he, when we were even dating, and he started telling me about all the O'Brien history. He just knew everything about the O'Briens. But he would always wind up going to this story from 1864 uh, uh, at Wood River when a wagon train of three wagons, of a Mormon wagon train came through in February of 1864, early February. And they had with them a little boy that was nine years old and he had a fever. And Ellen O'Brien, my husband's great-great-grandmother, grandpa's grandma, um, took the little boy in. Now they said, you know, we shouldn't come in. And she said, no, it's cold out. You come in. I'm going to take care of that little boy. They brought him in. She put him on a buffalo blanket in front of the fire. She said, you're going to go down a mile and you're going to go to my sister Mary's house because all these relatives, all these Irish relatives were all together in that settlement. You're going to stay at Mary's house tonight. You tell her I sent you there. And she's going to take care of you and put you up at their, you up at their road bench and tell her I told you not to charge them. Then don't charge these people, okay? So they, they go on, and a week later, her sister Mary's little boy comes down with the fever. 
and he dies. And then a, a week or two later, one of Ellen's little boys uh, comes down with a fever, the six-year-old, and he dies in late February. And as he's dying, another one of the little boys comes down with a fever, and he dies in early March. And then another one of the little boys dies uh, in later March uh, from the same fever that they got from that little wagon train. Uh, the only survivor was their little three-year-old boy, Dennis, who is my husband's great-grandfather. He was the one that survived uh, that uh, incident happening on the Mormon Trail. Of course, the O'Briens went on to take care of other travelers for years that were coming down uh, along the Mormon Trail, and they were very friendly with the, with the Mormon Trail. Um, before they came here, I want to back up just a little. Before they came to Nebraska, they were living in Iowa from 1856 to 1861. And Edmund was helping build his third railroad in the United States. Guess what city they were in? Iowa City, Iowa. And in Iowa City, Iowa, the, the building of the Chicago Rock Island Railroad had stalled. So as they are there, and that's where people are getting off to get their hand cards, because that's where the train ended, and then they would get their hand cards and come across. So they were already familiar with, with the people on the Mormon Trail and, and in the Mormon Church. Uh, when they were there and felt comfortable coming out and settling along the trail that the, that the, Mormon, uh, the Mormons were following uh, in this area. Um, the O'Briens came, of course, from Ireland. They understood, understood persecution. They had to learn about their faith in basements and hiding uh, from the English. So persecution was nothing new to them, and, and they were friendly with the Mormons. Uh, so I had, anybody know Val Rasmussen? Val Rasmussen. Uh, told me one time, he said, you know, your ancestors being friends with the Mormons had a name. There was a name that they were called because they were friendly with Mormons. Anybody know what that name is? Raise your quiz. If you were someone living on the trails or, and you were friendly with the Mormons, you, and this might be a little hard, it was hard for me to hear. Uh, you were called a Jack Mormon. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, that means you know better than a Mormon yourself. And certain people did not like you. You know, you, you, there were people that just weren't going to like you uh, because of that. So when I kept hearing this story from Grandpa, I, I, uh, and then later in 1864, this is Edmund O'Brien and Mary Collins Moore, his sister-in-law. In August of 1864, you may have heard of the Sioux Indian uprising along the trails. And they uh, left and started burning backwards on the trails of Colorado and, work, and Julesburg and started working their way uh, back this way. Uh, a lot of the pioneers fled. Uh, all of the women of the Wood River settlement fled, including Edmund's wife, Ellen. She fled with the one remaining little boy they had. And the only woman that was brave enough to stay was her sister-in-law, her sister, Mary. And Mary was at the house taking care of Ellen's gardens and a traveling photographer came through and said he would like to take their picture and Edmund talked her into acting like he was, they were married, in case the photographer was not going to take the picture because he had never had a picture taken of himself. So this was taken in August of 64 uh, during that, that Indian scare from the Lakota or the Sioux in central Nebraska. I met Dr. Manley along the way. Someone introduced me to him and one of his books was here. Uh, the, the Platte Valley Chronicles. Uh, I was fortunate that in my early 20s, I got, I got interested in this and I could interview Grandpa. He, was, he taught me lots and lots of things over 11 years. There was not one month that went by I did not learn something new from Grandpa O'Brien in 11 years as I was researching this. His memory was infallible and I could add it to what else I was finding. Uh, but I met Dr. Manley and fortunately Dr. Manley said, you know what, I was in my early 20s when I started interviewing the old timers and he said, let me tell you some of the things I learned. I learned volumes from him that's not written anywhere. It's just amazing the things that Dr. Manley knew. And when I started telling him things, he listened to me. That was the best part about Dr. Manley, he listened to me. Uh, he, he wanted to hear what I had to say when I was only 23, <laughs> which was great. Um, so then I, I wanted to know what was life like for these other settlers, that the pioneers that lived along here. I honestly was not interested in the Mormon, uh, his story. I was interested in what was it like to be a, a pioneer living in central Nebraska during this era when they were on this trail. So I started going to historical societies, started going to museums, 
I started going everywhere, especially in Hall County. I would pay a babysitter. I had two little ones at home. I'd pay a babysitter to go do research. And no matter who I went and talked to, they did not want to talk to me about the Mormon Trail. They were more than happy to talk to me about the Oregon Trail. They got all excited about the Oregon Trail. Oh, we have all kinds of things. We'll do research for you on it. But when I wanted to talk about the Mormon Trail, they just kind of shut off. And I thought, I'm paying a babysitter. But they said, you're more than happy to come in and look at our stuff. But if I was doing Oregon Trail, they would be willing to help me. Uh, so it was frustrating. It was very frustrating in those early years uh, to do that type of, of research. But I did. I went and I did the research. I found there was no internet. And this is in the 1990s. There's, there's no internet. Uh, so I had to go and I had to find the books because a lot of these books were old, no longer available. And, and I started finding out a lot about different families. And then I started uh, going down the trails. Oh, and then I found out about uh, four settlements that were along the Grand Island, the largest landmark along the trails in central Nebraska. And the four settlements here before 1860, um, I, I made my own map. I went and found the map of the old Grand Island that somebody told me about, and I created my own map just to show that there were actually four settlements here in, in central Nebraska in the 1850s along the Mormon Trail. Grand Island was the first one in 57. That was a German settlement. Mendota was right at the Wood River Crossing. Uh, so you could buy supplies when you crossed the river and you lost a lot of stuff. You could buy supplies right on the other side of Mendota. Uh, then there was the Wood River Settlement, which was the Irish Catholic Settlement. And then there was Wood River Center in 1858. That was Joseph Johnson sent out by Brigham Young to start a way station, uh, which is now Shelton. Okay, so I knew about those four settlements, started reading and finding more information about them. And then I thought, you know, I know the O'Brien stories, I know where they lived, and I know the trail went right there. I wonder if anybody else knows anything. So I just went down the road, knocking on doors. And it was absolutely incredible, because when I would knock on doors and tell people what I was looking for, a lot of these families still had their houses four generations later, and it was like they had been waiting for four generations for somebody to be interested in what they knew about. Nobody had ever asked what, ha what was out there. You wouldn't believe the receptions I got from these people as I went down the trail asking them if they knew anything. It was, it was incredible to meet them. So then in 1995, I heard that this uh, celebration, I read in the paper, I think. I saw a headline in the paper that the, um, night, the 150th was going to happen on the Mormon Trail and they were going to have a meeting in Kearney. Am I doing okay? How am I doing? Okay. And I thought, I have to go there. I had two little kids in school. I had another one that was a year old. I took her and, and the two of us went down to this meeting uh, in Kearney. They were wanting to start a Mormon Trail Association for the 150th. I thought, I can actually talk to some real Mormons. That was, that's, that was my word at the time. I can, I can actually talk to some real, because I couldn't go there. I couldn't go to Utah. I mean, I was tied down with my kids and, and you know, didn't have any, uh, any way to do that. My husband wouldn't let, wouldn't let me, I can tell you that one. Uh, he wouldn't let me make a trip like that if I was going to go somewhere. So I went and I met the most incredible people uh, there. Gail Holmes was there, and Val Rass, um, um, Carl Jones, all of these amazing... Bill, you might have been there. Can't remember. Um, but it was just absolutely amazing. And I went and I just wanted to learn. And there were maybe, I don't know, 12 of us there, 10, 12. And when I left, I was the new secretary of the Nebraska Mormon Trail Association. <laughs> and I thought, my husband's going to kill me. <laughs> so for uh, the next, and amazingly, I, I met Gail Holmes right away. He was the first one there. So I kind of told him about it. He said, you're going to talk before we leave here. So he made me get up and give a presentation before we left. So it was pretty amazing. Uh, so uh, for a year and a half, I put out a monthly newsletter uh, for the celebration in 1997. But let me tell you, I learned a lot. <laughs> because I had to put that newsletter out. Uh, so it was uh, just wonderful, and I have just built so many wonderful relationships because of that. So the next slide, oh, we have another squire lamb. I'm gonna throw in another squire lamb here. I just like some of his entries. So this one was written in May of 1863. There is no, and I like to do it so it looks like handwriting, even though it's hard to read, because his handwriting is hard to read. There is no end to this spring migration. Times is good here. Everything brings cash. There has about 3,000 passed already, some with carts and wheelbarrows, 
and some afoot packing their provisions and blankets. The other day, there was a drove of turkeys, geese, and hens passed that was equal the loads of colts toting to the mountains and loads of little pigs. So this is what they're seeing go by uh, all of the time on the trail. In 1991, we live in Jackson Township, which is the same, uh, this is the same township. So we're in the same township that the O'Briens were in. Uh, they put in the 911 emergency uh, signs on all the roads. All the roads in the country got street signs. It was really weird. We had street signs out in the middle of the country. Well, no sooner did those street signs go up, and I realized that, I'll, and I go out driving down here like I do all the time, and all of a sudden I realized, <laughs> hey, every time I take a turn almost, I see the old military road. So I started driving, and I thought, the old military road goes all the way between Shelton and Wood River. And I said, that has to be the trail. So I went and asked another historian, local historian, and she said, oh yeah, you know, by the time they, they came out and, and surveyed to make everything north and south in the 1860s, whenever they did it, there were so many people living along the Mormon Trail already, so many settlers here, that they had to leave that road. They had to leave it at the same angle as the trail. You can see they straighten it out at the end of each mile uh, to meet up with the grid system. But you can actually, from one mile north of Highway 30, from Wood River to Shelton, you can drive the actual Mormon Trail. You can follow that trail. Oh, another interesting thing about the Mormon Trail, everywhere I went and I talked to the historians and I talked to the local historians, they said, it's not the Mormon Trail. It's the California Trail, it's the Overland Trail, it's not the Mormon Trail. Every single uh, descendant that I talked to from the settlers that lived along there, oh, it's the Mormon Trail, it's nothing else. So the settlers called it the Mormon Trail that lived along it, but it was like the name was, you know, we don't use that name, don't use that name, you know. Okay, so uh, in a way, as I was going through this research, I, I was starting to almost get a sense of what it might feel like to be a Mormon and the reception they might have been getting in places as they were, and they were going along the trail because I was getting that, I was getting that kind of a reception five generations later, four or five generations, just asking about it. It was, and, and you know, I'm not sensitive. I, I mean, it took quite a few times before I was like, man, this just keeps happening. <coughs> So this is the map that Carl Jones, uh, LDS map maker, made once I met them in 1995. Uh, this was the 25 in an 11 mile stretch. And it went beyond Shelton's Horn Gibbon. 25 different Mormon trail sites were, were there. I, I, I don't like to say I found them because they were there all along. Nobody was looking. Okay. So uh, you can go online and find this too. I think it's under woodriverne.com. You can still find this map. Uh, and it's a printable map that you can download. But along the, on these 25 sites, there's a massacre site. There's an original bridge crossing across the Wood River. There are two Ezra Meeker stone markers when Ezra Meeker came back and Hall County marked where the trail, the original trail went across the county. There's one log house from the 1870s, five road ranches seven settlers without road ranches, one Pawnee Indian camp, Pawnee Indian camp, one store, one blacksmith shop, a swale, the Mormon way station that Joseph Johnson had, Joseph Johnson's well, depression was still there where all of the animals drank, the depression was still right there in the bricks of Main Street, they could never get it to go away, and the Huntsman's Echo newspapers are still there. The first uh, newspaper west of the Missouri River in Nebraska that Joseph Johnson had. Of those seven families with, that did not have road branches, four of them were families that had gone all the way to Utah and came back to stay with Johnson because they did not like polygamy. Uh, let me tell you, these families are still there. The Nutters, have you heard the name Nutter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's kind of cool that the Nutters are becoming famous. Um, the Nutters were there, the Olivers, huge families. Actually, about 10 years ago, an Oliver married a Nutter, and their kids are going to be related to almost everybody in two counties. <laughs> so the Olivers, the Nutters, the Lacys, the Dugdales all came back uh, to stay. Joseph Johnson himself left in 62 because he got tired of people not liking polygamy. <laughs> so, but, but interesting. So still, these families are there. Uh, they're big families, and in 1995, after we had that first meeting, uh, Val Rasmussen and, Rasmussen and some of the others said, you know, you need to give a talk. Have you met these families? I said, oh, no, we're not, we're, we're not from here. We moved to this area. 
uh, but we're back in the O'Brien area. They said, well, you should give a talk in the Shelton Library and we'll come. I said, oh no, I don't want to stand in front of a bunch of people and tell them their own family history. That, that just seems strange. They already know their family history. They said, well, I think you should do it and, we, and, and you should promote the fact that the celebration is going on. I thought, okay. So I went and I gave this talk in the library. I said, there aren't going to be 10 people there. That library was so packed. They were smacked up against the walls all around the entire building. And I thought, oh, are they here because they want to know what I get wrong? <laughs> you know? But when that was over, it was just like I had gone knocking on the doors. They were so excited that somebody was actually interested in their family history and their story. And it wasn't something people shouldn't talk about. It was wonderful. Uh, so some of the people there locally said, well, what, do you, what, what, what can we do? We need to do something. I said, well, I would think one of the best things you could do is start a historical society. So boom, they did. You know, All I had to do was throw out ideas after that, and, and the things started happening. Uh, but one of the neat things about this is as I was researching and as I would find out another thing, another thing, pretty soon things would start piecing together. And you know, one, if, you want, if you want to go out and do research 23-year-olds, right? One piece of information doesn't mean much, but a hundred pieces put together start to tell a story, really start to bring things together. So it took me 11 years, me and Grandpa O'Brien, 11 years. And by the way, Grandpa O'Brien actually knew his grandparents that settled here. He was a teenager when he was still living with them in the Wood River area uh, part of the years. So, I mean, he really knew the stories well. His memory is infallible. How am I doing? About done. About done. Okay, let me just take the, uh, let the slides take me through then. This was downtown, the things that were downtown from that map that he made. Uh, this was pictures of, in 1997, from Wood River to Shelton, we did a walk and we had the ribbons on stakes to represent the 6,000 people that died. If you went on that, you might remember that. That, uh, that turned out to be really memorable and that was just one of the things that I wanted to do. I thought that would be meaningful. Um, then that's from the Handcart Pioneers, once again, 2006. So why am I doing, now you understand maybe why I want to put these events on. You know, at the time I thought maybe people thought, well, she, they're doing this 150th anniversary in Kearney, Nebraska, because they want to make money. That, that had nothing to do with it. I wanted to honor the history that had happened and the people that were in the trail in this area. Squire Lamb, Eight, August 1862. The immigration has passed for this season. The last train, the 26th of August. The largest immigration for one season yet. It requires a pass to travel west. Speaking of travel, I must say that you would be surprised to see the ways of travel. Large trains of carts with one ox on a cart. Some wagons with eight yoke, horse teams, mule teams, sail wagons goes by wind, and steam wagons and hand carts and wheelbarrows. So wags the tide of life. So I went on, the, we have the internet now. Did you know that? I went on uh, last week and I looked up uh, something, anything to do with 1847, and here I find that the in 1847, some of the Brigham Young sent some people to stay with the Pawnee, and I, I, I knew nothing. I've not heard anything. I didn't. I mean, I've never researched it. Um, and it was interesting because then I, I'm almost done. Then I put together this little timeline. Timeline 1840s. Nothing's out here, right? Um, people are trying to save their lives and you know uh, having faith great faith and 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 on the Mormon trail right then come the eight and the, the pioneer there Pawnee's lives are pretty good in the 1840s the Sioux are starting to tr come into their area but it's pretty good they when they would get into the 1850s Nebraska becomes a territory that we can start settlers start settling man we have communities growing and uh, things are growing in Utah and the Pawnee really start struggling in the 1850s, really start getting pushed out in the government and having, having our time. And then we get to the 1860s, and more and more settlements in Nebraska, more and more settlers. The Union Pacific comes through. Man, we have all kinds of things going on, and, and I'm, I know there are struggles yet, but it's still life is, is getting better. You know, things are starting to happen in Utah, and the Pawnee are getting crunched and crunched and crunched, and they eventually leave. And when I look at these cultures and it's so wonderful for me to have been able to build a relationship with the people in the LDS Church. I went to Utah and talked to the uh, Mormon Trails Association there. Met wonderful, wonderful people there. I was invited out there to talk. Uh, and have, have grown these wonderful relationships. Um, feel like I'm a Jack Mormon. I'm proud of it. <laughs> you know, it's wonderful. 
And and then I have I build this relationship with the Pawnee, and yes, re- adopted into the Pawnee tribe. First female in history to be adopted into the Pawnee tribe, since so she's gonna go there uh, in 2018, and still working with them, and I have people in this room who are helping work with them. Uh, the Pawnee are gone. The Pawnee were removed, uh, they helped remove, and they're down in Oklahoma. I've been talking to my friends at the Pawnee, I know lots of Pawnee, they're coming next week, a whole bunch of them. And I said, what, what do you know about your history with the, the Mormon church, with the Mormon trail and Mormon church? And I was talking to my, my corn sister, and she said, I don't know, let me ask my brother, he's the historian for the tribe, they're oral, they're oral historian. Sorry, <laughs> I can write home. <laughs> She, she, uh, she, so she sent my text to him. She's texted him. This is the same information that I just had up here. She sent that to him. He said, oh, that's just general information. That's just normal stuff for us, uh, you know. But he came back and he said, have her talk to Kelly. And I said, and so she texted me. I said, who's Kelly? Here's her phone number. Talk to Kelly. Call Kelly. She's a relative of them. Kelly is Pawnee and Kelly is LDS. I've never heard of Kelly before. I said, Kelly, would you like to know some LDS? She said, I've been waiting to talk to you for years. <laughs> and, and I said, have you ever, have the Pawnee and the LDS people ever done anything? I mean, she said, the Pawnee, we were the first tribe that the, L, that the Mormons met. We were the first ones. And there was all this history, and I know all this stuff. I said, would you like to give a talk somewhere? And she said, would I ever? I said, well, I'll just throw it out there, see if somebody's... Uh, willing to let you have a talk be needed if it was during the 175th anniversary too. You know, to just, you know, the, the Pawnee helped everybody. They helped all of us and they suffered the most. They really suffered the most. So I just think that would be cool. And I'm done. Okay.